just to finish up the inflammation, the so what causes inflammation? So when the body is grounded, if there's any remaining radicals, reactive radicals left after an oxidative burst, then they're going. To, they're only going to last about three or four nanoseconds. So they're going to go and rip an electron from something in the near environment, which happened to be you know a healthy cell, and damage it. So they rip an electron from a healthy cell, and then that causes the immune system to send another neutrophil, and then you set up a chain reaction. And the reason is because you don't have enough free electrons in the body to reduce those remaining radicals before they can damage another cell. So as long as you're grounded, that can't occur, occur. But as soon as you put your shoes on, then all of a sudden you start depleting yourself of free electrons, and then you run out of electrons, you don't have enough. To give you an example, uh, animals who live in the wild, dogs, deer, you know, all the animals, all the wild kingdom, Cancer very rarely manifests in the animal world. The only time it, it shows up is when humans have contaminated the animal environment. On the other hand, animals who live in the- Namaste, sweet souls. My name is Shilpa, and you're listening to the Omni Mindfulness Podcast. I am a mindset and meditation coach for professional women and mompreneurs. The purpose of the show is to offer stories and content that allows you to increase your awareness of your authentic self and be inspired by connecting to the personal and professional stories of other souls. Souls who are walking the walk and living everyday human experiences with inspired intentions. These are the stories that will expand your consciousness and spark within you to ask, what if? Each season, I offer content to help you create a holistic lifestyle that embodies spirituality, mindfulness, mindset, and energy awareness. Through my conversations with experts in their niche area and solo casts from yours truly, my intention is to help you holistically revitalize, reset, and relax your body, mind, and spirit. I'm your host and founder of Omni Mindfulness. So ask yourself, what if just one story could be the catalyst to shift the trajectory of my life? What if I become instrumental in serving other souls to realize their true self? And what if my soul's higher purpose is in the realization of omni-mindfulness joy? It's never too late to rewrite your story. And now, today's episode. Welcome back, sweet souls. This is your host, Shilpa. I wanted to share some exciting news about a little challenge I'm running as I'm trying to get more people to discover this podcast and the conversations that inspire those who value personal growth. And the best way to do that is to leave reviews. You can leave a review on Spotify, Google Podcasts, or Apple Podcast. So my request to you is to leave a review if you feel that you've received any value at all from these episodes of Omni Mindfulness. It would mean so much to me if you could write a little review regarding any episode that resonated with you. Please take a screenshot of that review and email it to me at omnimindfulness at gmail.com. In return, I will offer you my one-page guide to spark your meditation practice through Sankalpa. Sankalpa is a Sanskrit word for intention setting. Along with this, you'll receive a link to my guided meditation that will guide you through an intention setting meditation, positive affirmations, which you can practice daily. I guarantee that this gift will help you start a daily intention setting practice with a spark. It is my gift for you for being a listener, being a supporter, and of course, to enable you to manifest the best meditation practice. We are now in the sixth podcast season. Each month, my guests and I explore a facet of how mindfulness applies to modern day living. In April, my guests and I delve into the topic of eco-conscious living. The topic of courage and resiliency is covered in May and wrapping up the season of mindfulness in June with the topic of heart-centered awareness. Stay tuned.
And up next is Clint Ober, the co-author of Earthing. For more than 20 years, Clint has dedicated his life to improving the health of everyone on Earth. In 1998, after a successful career grounding systems in the cable television industry, Earthing pioneer Clint began investigating the potential to improve human health with grounding. Today, he is the founder of EarthFX Incorporated, a grounding research and development company based in California through which he helped to develop and patent the first indoor earthing products. Earthing and grounding therapy are sold by Clint's companies on this site, earthing.com, and also on amazon.com and other select authorized retailers. His products are used by millions of people every day around the globe to improve the quality of their health. And now, here's Clint. Clint, thank you so much for being on my podcast. Well, thank you for having me. Um, it's a real pleasure and um, uh, it makes my day to be able to communicate and share everything with another group of people. <laughs> As I mentioned to you before we hit record, every guest I have is selected because they resonate with some aspect of my life that I am trying to enhance or improve. And I believe that helps entrepreneurial moms. And I also believe that it will help humanity. So with that said, share maybe the the backstory of how you got started in this, in this journey. Okay. That's a, that's a long one. Uh, And I'll try to keep it as short as possible so we can get to the the things that I think everybody will want to hear most. But I started, uh, you know, I started out in Montana on a, you know, I was a Montana cowboy as a, and that's a boy who sits on a horse and just rides around the pasture and, and um, checks on the livestock and make sure everybody's healthy and, and whatever. And if something's, if, if for instance, a, a cow is not healthy, you take them out of the herd and you put them in a holding pen and you, then you ride the pasture and make sure that the water's, test the water, make sure it's okay. Uh, you check the pasture and make sure the grass is not too short where they are. Uh, there's no noxious weed growing uh, so because the concept is if you keep the pasture clean and pristine, then uh, the animals will be healthy and happy. And then you can uh, make a living. Uh, if you let the cattle get sick, then you have to call the vet and you have to call the banker at the same time and say, throw them the keys and say, hey, we're out of here. You guys own this <laughs> because there's no way you can afford to uh, be in the business. With that, with and let you keep your uh, animals healthy and your crops and your and your soil and everything. So, but so I, I have a very earthy background, and I grew up with uh, spent a lot of time in nature, a lot of time alone in nature. And when you spend a lot of time alone in nature, you you tend to connect with any living thing around you, all the animals for sure, but <clears throat> but the trees, the the uh, the fungi, everything that's going on out there. I mean, it's, there's a whole world that we have that we have lost our connection with. And, but anyhow, so I, I have this kind of a, it's a, I guess it's a spiritual thing, but it, it's, it's like, um, you know, the trees are my cousin. The first, first question I ever asked in life that I can remember was, and I was just a little kid and I remember sitting on the ground is how did the grass know to grow? You know, how does the wind know to blow? Who's, who's running this, you know? And because I was always very inquisitive. So, but anyhow, I spent, uh, I left that environment when I was uh, in, in my late teens, early 20s. And I ended up um, being attracted to the communications industry and primarily cable television and broadcast television. And because I lived in a small town in Montana where you only had two TV stations and one was right, one was left, and they were always arguing, and it was always political and and that kind of a thing. But as soon as I saw that you could have uh, more than one TV signal via microwave or whatever, and and um, uh, the world was a little bigger. The first TV signals we received in Montana was like Casper, Wyoming, 
WGN out of Denver. And then, and then the story goes on and, and we started to build uh, this communication system that where the world could see itself, where people could, uh, now today you can see people around the world. You can see news around the world. You can see everything instantly. And to me, it's like, wow, there's, I mean, but I've, I was, I've always been a part of this and I, and I just loved it because it wasn't that somebody's right or wrong. It's that's who we are. <laughs> and we get to see who we are individually uh, in, in reference to everybody else living on the planet. And, <clears throat> and it's, uh, it changes everything, it changes your perception, changes how you are. And, uh, and I think for the good, I mean, there is bad too, but it's, I think generally it's for the good. And uh, <clears throat> so communications and education is something I've always, always believed in. And then <clears throat> in that industry, uh, we eventually ended up um, putting together data services. So I was one of the first people to ever put together a unified data stream bounce it off the satellite, feed it down a cable system and connect it to a, a, a Commodore computer or an Apple or, or you know, you know, the very early, early computers. Uh, yeah, we could, <clears throat> you could even, uh, you know, we had everything from every wire service in the world from TESS, from Russia, Xinhua from China, Kaido from Japan, uh, AP, UPI, all of the stock services, Monchek, Weber, and all the, uh, you know, like, classified, I mean, um, TV data, uh, all that stuff. We put it all, anything that was on a wire service, put it in a unified data stream, bounced it off the satellite, fed it down the cable system. This was before the internet. And then if you had a Commodore 64 or a, an Apple, we had a little piece of software that you could program in your favorite stock quotes or your sports team or whatever. So you could read the data stream. Uh, keyword read the data stream and create your own little newspaper <laughs> yeah. and, and so that was an intuitive thing to me um and and, and it, it's something that was in me i just saw the world as I, I remember saying one time that at some time in the future the poorest person standing in a in a in a, in a rice paddy in china will eventually have this access to the same information as anybody on wall street or anybody else in the world and that has come to pass <laughs> and but i but i saw this 20 30 years ago 40 years ago 50 years ago um so anyhow i, I that's kind of my background but what got me to grounding is in that industry everything has to be connected to the earth and the reason is <clears throat> the earth has a what we call a negative surface charge meaning no charge no 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 like static electricity no charge and <clears throat> and it's stable it's electrically stable so the universally the earth has a it has a what we call a ground plane and if you stick a ground rod in the earth then electrons can go up or down the ground rod and to wherever it's connected, a wire, into the home, to the refrigerator, or to a computer, or anything. And so these electrons can, uh, they are attracted to charge. If there is a charge somewhere, then they're going to migrate instantly, sometimes speed of light, um, <clears throat> and reduce a, a positive. And <clears throat> so it's about uh, maintaining the electrical stability of the system and, and a constant. So you have a constant reference and, um, and, and then, um, so <clears throat> in order to have nice clean pictures, you have to ground the cable system so that the static, the noise from the static electricity from the wind blowing or dust or whatever, or the EMFs or the electromagnetic interference that there's is pervasive in our environments. And, you know, everything from even airplane communications, everything is, the, it's just, if you could see frequency in our environment, you wouldn't be able to see anything because it would be pitch black. Um, and frequency is something that's rather modern to the human uh, environment. And so it's 
something that we, our whole lives are about it. And, but a hundred years ago, it didn't hardly, it hardly exist. So <clears throat> there's some new things that have gone on and we're all in love with it and enlightened with it because it's bright and light and it's alive and you can tune into a hundred or a thousand different channels and pick your own scenario of whatever you want and so on. But, but anyhow, so, but the main thing is in order for you to have those nice pictures, a nice clean data on the on your without glitches and so on. Um, <clears throat> then you when you ground it to the earth, it reduces all the environmental uh, electromagnetic interference. Anything that would be could be electromagnetic interference or static charges, just to, to maintain a clean, stable like internal electrical environment, so you can have good clean data, good clean pictures on your TV set or your computer and your cell phone. So, uh, so anyhow, I have a, with that, I have a 30 year working knowledge of grounding, not something that most people think about. <laughs> it just doesn't cross your mind, no reason. And so uh, in order to, um, as time went on, we always had to improve the systems. We always had to improve the grounding because the, the systems became more technical and, and so on. So grounding is about, Remember this electrical stability. It's to maintain a constant. So, and then anything that is connected to the earth is, um, if it's not connected to the earth, any metal conductive object or any connective, any body, like a human body that is conductive, anything in the environment that is not connected to the earth, it's an antenna. And it will attract like EMFs or uh, electromagnetic, like static electricity. You'll build up static electricity on your body. If you touch something, you know, you, you get a spark. So if you're not connected to the earth, then your body becomes an antenna for all of the uh, contact and separation charges like um, and tribal charging, you know, just things we don't even, that we're not aware of because we don't see it. So our bodies, if we live in a modern home, we're, we're walking around with huge static charges. Every time you take a step in a home, I mean, you're raising your foot off the floor. If you have shoes on, especially, you're creating contact and separation, uh, which results in static charges on the body. You go touch a doorknob and, go in and it goes zap. Or you get into bed at night, you're in a, sleeping on a foam bed, you pick the covers up on a dry night, and you can see a, a static storm underneath the sheets. <laughs> and you're sleeping in that. And so, <clears throat> but, but we're unaware of it because we don't see it. And uh, we feel it, our, but we don't sense what, it's, what it is. So, <clears throat> so anyhow, um, electrical stability is, it, it was one thing. The, the second thing is to prevent fire. Because if you have cable lines and wires and telephone wires, everything up in the air, and there's a lightning strike in the air, then that lightning can hit the line and travel down the line. And you have to have a ground rod in the before it goes into the home, the wire, so that it can take that charge to earth rather than going on into the home, which would blow up a TV set, cause a fire. And, and so it's really to prevent fire, to maintain clean electrical stable environment and to prevent fire. That's what grounding is all about, not much else. Um, <clears throat> but it's essential, everything in the world has electrically is grounded to the earth in order to maintain this electrical stability. And this constant, this constant reference that everything electrical is measured against is the surface of the earth. So, <clears throat> so anyhow, um, that's just to say I have a background, a working background in the knowledge of electrical, not something that the average person would know about. And so anyhow, when I was um, 50 years old, I, I had, I was in the, uh, I, I, I had gotten sick over the holidays and uh, they couldn't figure out quite what it was. And so I would go to the doctor and they'd run a test and, and uh, they'd come back and they would rule that out. And then they want to do another test and another test. It went on for about three weeks and I kept getting sicker and sicker. And then so I had to end up going into the emergency room and I had um, 
uh, they put me in a CAT scan the next sometime in the middle of the night, I guess. And they identified that uh, I had an abscess in my liver. And uh, in the morning when the uh, doc came in, he said, we have some good news and some bad news. The good news is we found out what uh, is causing your health issues. He said, you have developed an abscess in the liver and it has exploded. And, and uh, they said, um, uh, the bad news is that there is so much damage that has been done to your liver that you, we don't know what to do because we, you can't just get on a list and get a, a donation of a liver. You, that could take a year, could take a long time. And then on the other hand, they don't know how much of the liver they can cut out and you can still survive. So anyhow, they sent me home and they said, you need to go home, get your act together and take care of your affairs. And that was kind of a shock. I was 50 years old. And here I thought I was king of the mountain. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, but it's like every 50 year old man hits the wall around. Uh, every man hits the wall around the age of 50. And I think women do, too, now. Um, <clears throat> but you're trying to, you know, prove to the world or kill the world or go out and win the battle or win the war, whatever. And then, but you don't pay attention to your health. And after about the age 30, you're, I mean, you're invincible up till then, but after that, it goes downhill. And no matter who you are, it's just entropy. But, <clears throat> but anyhow, um, I ended up uh, about a week or so later, a young surgeon from Swedish Medical Center in Denver called and they said they wanted to do some experimental surgery and find out how much blood liver they could cut out, see if they could save enough that I could recover. And they, and I had no choice, so I agreed. And I went into uh, not knowing that I would come out, and uh, but I had no real option. And I was in so much pain, I would have done anything anyway. Um, <clears throat> But anyhow, I woke up a couple of days later in ICU, and what they had done is they went in and cut out five sixths of my liver on the main lobe, uh, and just left one portion of it that was connected to the main artery. It took me about a month to be able to really walk around the house to have enough energy, and it took me about six months to walk a mile, and. Um, <clears throat> And then at the end of about six, seven months, uh, my liver had regrown back to its original size, not in the six different pockets, but in the main lobe grew back to the, the size that it originally was. And so here I am at 50 years old with a brand new liver <laughs> and I survived. So anyhow, after that, you're asking how I got how I got here. I'm telling a short story. So that, so that event happened. But when that happened, I, I just, I, 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 I came close to death and I thought I had died. <laughs> um, and, but anyhow, when I was home from the, from the hospital, I, I was laying in bed one morning and I was looking out, I was staring out the window uh, and, and I lived in Evergreen, Colorado. There was pine trees and in that, that kind of a country. And all, and I looked out the window, and the sky was just a brilliant, vibrant blue. The pine needles were a vibrant and green, but everything was electrical or vibrant. And I didn't know what to think of it, except that maybe I thought maybe one of the drugs was still working or something. Mm -hmm. But but I looked around the room, and I had been a large collector of Western art for all my life. And I, I love art. And, uh, and I, um, at the end of my bed was this really special painting. And <clears throat> it was, you know, a huge painting. And I, I, I looked at it and I thought to myself, what would have happened had I died? Who would have come and taken these things? What would they have done with them? They don't realize the value of them or, or the why I would have bought them, why I cut, why I invested in them. And then I realized, <clears throat> had this epiphany that, um, uh, that, you know, I didn't own any of this stuff really. It all owned me. I had spent my life collecting all these things and building a bigger house and bigger house so I could take care of all these things. And I was living in a 5,000 square foot two-bedroom home 
A-frame log home in Evergreen, Colorado. It could have been a ski lodge, <laughs> but but I really had it for my art because I loved this art. And so <clears throat> as soon as I recognized that, I just had all of a sudden had this aversion. I didn't want to own anything. So I called my children. I said, come and get whatever you would have taken had I died. The rest I'm going to donate and give away and put where it belongs in the public and um and they did they come and took a few odd things and most of them i just left so i sold my home left everything and i went on a i bought a small a real small rv had two and a half all i had left me left when i left on left the home was two and a half suitcases that i put in the rv and for four years i did nothing except travel around the United States. And I spent most of that time in national parks or earthy places. And um, after about four years of, and just visiting old friends and whatever, and, and after about four years, I, I knew I never wanted to go back to work to make money. I wanted to go to work um, and do something because when I almost died, I, had this horrible feeling that I should have done something better with my life, more with my life. I should have made my life about something more than just fighting other people over money and power and whatever. And so I, so I, um, I, I, I after about four years, I was down in Key Largo, Florida, parked uh, across the bay on the bayside. <clears throat> and that night down the, the mangroves in the, you know all the vegetation there and it was just really an earthy place and i was standing there and manatees came up i was feeding us some fresh water and all of a sudden i had this overwhelming sensation come over me that the nature or earth or something was talking to me that i needed to go back west i needed to do something so the next day i'd been there for six months the next day i packed everything up and I headed back to, I went to California and decided I can't be there, went to Arizona, can't be there. So I ended up to Flagstaff, Arizona, where I thought it's kind of like Montana, where I grew up. I just wanted to be home, I think. And um, <clears throat> so anyhow, on the way up to, from Phoenix up to Flagstaff that night, I can't run, it was getting late and I, uh, <clears throat> saw a little RV sign, RV park. So I pulled into the RV park and I ended up in Sedona, Arizona. And in the morning I woke up because it was late at night, I didn't see. So in the morning I woke up, looked out the window and, or looked out the door and I looked around. I said, I'm not leaving here. This is like living in a national park. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so anyhow, I spent two years in Sedona, Arizona. While I was there, this town is full of art galleries. And, and while I was there, I, I, I would go around to the art galleries and I eventually got to know several of them. Anyhow, there was an exhibit coming to town and I pleaded with this one gallery owner to please let me come in and help her light the gallery and display the art because I knew the artists, I knew the value and everything. And it took a, quite a bit of convincing, but finally she conceded. Uh, let me come in. I went in. They had like 200 paintings in the gallery and 500 lights. And you had to have a baseball cap in order to see the art. And so I went in, took all the lighting down, took all the paintings down, took everything down, put it all away. And then I had them bring in these. There was only a dozen pieces of art. Had them bring them in and put them where they wanted them. And then I went back and put up lighting and lit each piece individually so at each all of them had presence with kind of a shadow darkness around them but more like a north light more like the artist intended them to be seen <clears throat> and then <clears throat> anyhow afterwards when the lady came back in she just stood there her mouth hit the floor she says i have never seen anything so beautiful in my life and i said thank you <laughs> and then they had the show and it was a great show and a very successful show and um, <clears throat> so anyhow, after that, I ended up having all the other art gallery owners from Scottsdale to Tao to, you know, so everybody came to see this exhibit. And so they saw the lighting and they all said, who did the lighting? And they said, well, and they introduced me to a few of them. And then all of a sudden I ended up with a little business called Best of Show. And all I did was go light art galleries, just light art. 
they didn't have any money to pay me <laughs> by and large oh. but i just i just loved art oh, so yeah. in the I process just, i just have to share clint that um my minor was art history and i'm a, okay i love art okay well then you understand what i was doing and um so anyhow as as a result of that little business one day i was sitting at my computer and I was getting ready to type an order in for the wholesale house to get some lighting parts. And the computer kept crashing. And this had been going on for a while. And finally, I recognized that, you know, this static electricity. So I ran, I put a piece of copper tape across my desk. Back then, computers weren't grounded. So <clears throat> they put a copper tape across my desk and I connected it to a ground, to a wire and connected it to the electrical ground. And so then anytime before I touched my computer, I'd touch the tape discharge the static electricity on my body then i could go type and everything was perfect <laughs> and after i got my order in i went outdoors and i sat on a bench across you know across from talakapaki a, a nice little tourist attraction there and a big tour bus pulls up and on this tour bus was a group of japanese tourists and they got off the bus in kind of single file and they all had what appeared to big white Nike tennis shoes. And they were a little shorter in stack. And so maybe that's why they stood out. I'm not sure. But, but it just crossed my mind intuitively. I said, I wonder if there's a consequence to humans no longer being naturally grounded. I had no idea. But I had just been playing and grounded myself to get rid of the static electricity. And so I knew that you know, the human body, I've always known that the human body is, carries a charge if you have rubber sole shoes on. And I didn't know. Uh, so I went home that night and I started measuring the electrical charges on my body when I was walking around my home. Without shoes or with shoes? Without, with shoes, just like normal. And so I would have these huge static charges build up, you know, up to as many as five, 6,000 volts. And that happens to everybody, but you don't see it unless it's up around five, 6,000 volts. Then if you touch something, there'll be a spark or a shock and you can feel it. But 3,000 volts, you don't feel it. Um, <clears throat> so, and I went up to my bedroom and that was the highest. Uh, and you had all these EMFs in the walls for, the, you know, the electrical wires from the, behind the wall where you you have your pillow just six inches from all this bundle of electrical wire running through your walls and i just measured all this stuff and i said wow this is crazy and so i i went back to the hardware store and i bought a roll of three inch wide i think it was three inch wide metal duct tape that you wrap around heating ducts but it was metal and and so i Took a chunk of it, taped it across my bed, threw a wire out the window, connected it to the tape, and connected it to a ground rod in the earth, and then connected another piece to a voltmeter. And then I lay down on my bed. And so when I lay down on my bed, and I knew this intuitively, that's why I did this, because this is how you get rid of electrical noise in, in a communication system, more ground. So I grounded myself, and sure enough, all the charges on my body went to zero. Static electricity dropped to zero because <clears throat> when you're touching the earth, the earth is infinitely large, infinitely. You can't imagine how large compared to the body, which is infinitely small. So when these two things come together, then if the earth has a charge, which it does, a negative charge, uh, which means an abundance of electrons that reduce and prevent charge. So as soon as you touch the earth, then your body becomes charged with earth free electrons and meaning negative. And so you, any charge in your body is automatically neutralized or eliminated, period. But that's the principle behind grounding in the first place. Okay, so, so anyhow, I uh, didn't think too much about it, but all of a sudden I woke up, the meter was, when I went to bed, the meter was on my chest and I was just kind of thinking about all this. And the next morning I woke up, the meter was by my side and I thought, wow, there's something going on here because normally I was 50, 54 years old. Normally for me to go to bed, I, you know, as a cowboy, I had spent 
you know, skied for 30 years, crazy skied and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And uh, uh, tennis, you know, I've had every kind of injury you can think of. <laughs> and so I had a lot of pain in my 50s. And <clears throat> and I, I remember, you know, one time going outside and looking up and just screaming, you know, hey, God, why did you make my body with so much pain in it? Because <laughs> it was horrible. And but anyhow, that night, uh, normally I would have taken a Advil or something to go to sleep. And uh, that night I just fell asleep the next morning. And I, I, I was just shocked that I had fallen asleep. So I got up and I said, well, there's got to be something going on here because when I'm grounded, I mean, you know, I, it just helps me sleep. So I did that for a couple of more nights. And then I recognized that, wow, there's, this is real started to look around. I couldn't find anything on the internet back then. All we had was AOL or Nexus Lexus, where you could download some data. And I couldn't find anything that would ex relating grounding the body to reduce pain. And then I, a couple of my friends, uh, uh, I just invited them over and told them what I was doing. I said, you guys need to do this. So I went and grounded their beds and they did the same thing I did. And, and the next but two days later, one of them comes over and he says, he says, yeah, this, uh, this really does work. But he says, do you think it has, can be having an effect on my arthritis? And I said, I don't think so. I think it just helped you sleep better. And then all of a sudden I realized that my pain was almost completely gone. Chronic pain for years had almost completely gone. And I said, whoa, there's something really going on here. And, uh, and so then... I couldn't find any information anywhere. So I went down to Tucson, the University of Arizona in Tucson. I uh, got a hold of a couple of people down there, looked in some of the medical literature. There's no such, I mean, cause of pain unknown, cause of MS unknown, cause of, everything is cause unknown. The medical community doesn't know these things. And I thought, wow, I thought these guys knew everything <laughs> and uh, not putting them down or anything like that. I'm just saying, I, I just assumed that you know, everybody knows this stuff. And, but anyhow, there was nothing in the literature whatsoever about grounding the body to reduce pain or improve sleep. So after about a month or so, I, I packed up my little RV and drove to UCLA. I figured these guys are smart. <laughs> They've got to know everything. So I went there and I ended up talking to some people in a sleep lab and they said, you expect us to believe that somebody's going to put a nail in the ground, tie a wire around it, and tie a wire run somebody's toe, they're going to sleep better. They said, get out of here. You're nuts. <laughs> and anyhow, we did carry on a conversation for a little while afterward. But bottom line was, in order to do a study, it would cost millions of dollars. And it would take years to get done, according to them. And then um, and there's no guarantee it would be published. And I said, well, this is important. People don't know about this. And so anyhow, they dismissed me. But a couple of the young fellows there took an interest in it, and they helped me design a anecdotal study. So what we did is we grounded. We took 60. We gathered up 60 people over a few months and made up some simple ground planes, little grounding mats that were uh, 12 inches wide by 24 inches long, connected them to they were conductive, like for in the ESD or electrostatic discharge industry or where people need to be grounded before they can work on software or chips or anything electrical. <clears throat> and then, uh, so anyhow, um, uh, we ended up doing a study. 30 of the subjects were grounded, 30 of them were not. And what we were asking them is, you know, do you sleep better? Do you have less pain? And that was the question so that we really wanted to know. But when the when the nurse who was doing the follow up with everybody came back after six eight weeks whatever it was, um, <clears throat> she was getting people talking about TMJ going away, about um, uh, you know all kinds of you know PMS issues and you know one lady one young girl in her in her I think she was in her early twenties she had to take a week off every month during her menstrual cycle because she was in such trauma she a lot of women we deal with so many of those type of issues but we yeah. think that we're isolated yes and I, i'm past 
I'm now in my 50s. But honestly, if I had known this before the 50s, it would have helped me. Oh, yes. Well, I hope. <laughs> but anyhow, so there were several things that showed up that we didn't even ask questions about. And these are just their, their own personal stories about what they had experienced. And they were all anecdotal. So, but I had enough evidence now that I could go back to the scientific community and say, here's what I found uh, in a quasi study. And <clears throat> so I ended up finding a doc in uh, uh, San Diego who had just retired and he was an, an, uh, an anesthesiologist, which has a lot of knowledge of you know, I mean, the right kind of person to do some research. And so he said he wasn't sure that there's anything to what I was talking about, but he said, let's go do a test. So we grounded a dozen people and uh, we measured saliva cortisol for <clears throat> every four hours for 24 hours. Then we grounded them for six to eight weeks, remeasured the cortisol. And then what we saw as a result is everybody's cortisol was all over the place uh, in the before grounding. Because uh, your cortisol has a 24-hour circadian profile, and in the morning or 4 a.m. it skyrockets, and at 6 a.m. it's the highest, and then it depletes all day long, and then at nighttime, when during sleep, it's near zero. And but what we found before grounding, everybody's was all over the place. In fact, we even had some stewardesses from New York that were based in San Diego for some reason. And so they were participating in the study, but they spent half their time in New York, half the time in San Diego. When we did their uh, test, we found that their cortisol was three hours off. That meant that um, they were on New York time. So your cortisol is regulated by where you are on the planet based on something to do with the sun and the moon and everything in the universe. Uh, and these are things that we don't recognize today. But <clears throat> so anyhow, um, but when the study was all done, everybody's cortisol synchronized into a perfect band. Uh, lowest at midnight, highest uh, at 4 a.m. and took off and went to the highest at 6 a.m. and then it depleted throughout the day. And so everybody's cortisol, and they, they didn't know each other. These were distant women from each other, but everybody's cortisol synchronized, meaning that something, there's no daylight, there's no sound, there's no environmental uh, indica, uh, you know, to promote this uh, action. So <clears throat> we knew that it had to be something in the earth. I mean, the earth itself, there was a, a, a frequency of the earth or a something in the earth was cueing cortisol at 4 a.m. to skyrocket. And, and then because the stewardesses were three hours off, we knew that that was three hours of time. So, so from New York to LA. And so, so we knew that there was that uh, just standing on the earth uh, resets your cortisol clock. You're, and so jet lag is when you fly somewhere and you're three hour, your cortisol three hours off, feels like your body's got full of acid. <laughs> so, so anyhow, so we learned, first of all, that there is a connection and, and we did, everybody did sleep better. Everybody did have less pain. And then everybody reported all of these various uh, benefits. So that led to, you know, gave us some credibility. Then all of a sudden, uh, now 25 years later, we have done over 30 peer reviewed published studies to show that the human body, when the human body is connected to the earth, that it is grounded. And when the body is grounded, just like in a, uh, in a computer or a wash machine or anything else, anything is grounded, there cannot be an electrical charge in it. So then, <clears throat> uh, so, so that was the, that's kind of the story, but the, the main thing is we learned very quickly that grounding reduced pain in the body but we didn't know how or why. Nobody knew how or why. So back when we started doing the earthing, uh, this is in the late 90s, and <clears throat> it was around 2004. We had done several studies, but in 2004, uh, Ritger and the boys back at Boston Mass published a paper, a paper or an article in Time Magazine. And it showed the body on fire and flames, and it had the word inflammation. 
This was the first time the word inflammation had been exposed to the public. The word inflammation had never been used. This is 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Yeah, just 20 years ago. And what they were saying was that you do not have cancer. You do not have indigestion. You do not have any of these named health disorders. What you have is chronic inflammation. And the result of that inflammation is manifesting differently in different people based on your lifestyle and your genetics. And, that, and so I said to myself, when I read that, I said, well, if inflammation is the cause of all these health disorders, then we know what the cause of inflammation is. Because we also learned that, I mean, immediately that inflammation is a byproduct, or pain is a byproduct of inflammation. You can't have pain if you don't have inflammation first. So if you have any pain in your body whatsoever, you have inflammation in your body. The word inflammation means in flame, on fire. We were talking about grounding in the electrical world is to prevent fire, to prevent charge from creating fire. So anyhow, then we set about our new mission was, was to identify why, what is the mechanism? Why does grounding reduce pain? Why does grounding re prevent inflammation? So <clears throat> after a year or so of study, I ran across the paper where they were talking about the white blood cells and specifically neutrophils. Neutrophils are, you know, white blood cell that <clears throat> if you uh, have a pathogen in the body or a damaged cell, um, <clears throat> then the immune system senses it, recognizes it, and it sends a neutrophil over and it'll swim over and it will wrap itself around the pathogen or the damaged cell and encapsulate it. It's kind of a jelly type cell. And then as soon as it's encapsulated, it releases what we call reactive oxygen species. Now reactive oxygen, or the word reactive means it's electrically charged. In the communication, you know, it's reactive, you know. So <clears throat> as soon as as soon as that um, I, I put that together, then all of a sudden there was a like a big noise outdoors or whatever. But anyhow, then boom, that was it. And then I realized that the immune system is electrical. The immune system is uh, working with electrically charged molecules. And so these molecules, what they do, they 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 are they have enough uh, re reactive charge that they can strip an electron away from a healthy cell. And that's how the, or not a healthy cell, but from a pathogen. That's how the immune system destroys pathogens. It goes on every day, all day long in your body. Uh, and that's normal and it never was a problem until about 1960, we invented <laughs> plastics. The first thing we did is we put them on the soles of our shoes carpeted our homes and every sense have plasticized everything in the world, even the steering wheel in our car. And as an Indian woman, we would enter mm -hmm. our home, we would leave our shoes, yes. leave our um, sandals at the entrance of the home. Yeah. At the mm -hmm. time, it was called being spiritual. You're leaving right. out energy outside. Well, now, so like but, by leaving your shoes out, how does that help? Well, <clears throat> when you take your shoes off and you walk barefoot, then you can't create a static charge on your body because um, the body's conductive. When you, when the shoes are not conductive. So when you create charge, the charge stays on the body and that charge influences everything in the body and it penetrates the body you know, via the, the lungs and the respiratory system and so on. And it's like asthma and so on. But <clears throat> so, when you're grounded, I mean, or when, you, when you're grounded outdoors, you absorb free electrons from the earth and that prevents charge from occurring in your body. But when you go barefoot in the home, uh, it's not going to add electron and reduce existing inflammation, but it's going to prevent the static from building an additional charge on your body. You're gonna be able to breathe easier and so on. So, and you're going to feel feel better if you don't have your shoes on. Take your shoes off and you immediately feel better. I don't care who you are, no matter where you are. Um, so, so anyhow, 
as a result, so the, the, just to finish up the inflammation, the, so what causes inflammation? So when the body is grounded, if there's any remaining radicals, reactive radicals left after an oxidative burst, then they're, going to, they're only going to last for about three or four nanoseconds. So they're going to go and rip an electron from something in the near environment, which happened to be you know, a healthy cell and damage it. So they rip an electron from a healthy cell. And then that causes the immune system to send another neutrophil. And then you set up a chain reaction. And the reason is because you don't have enough free electrons in the body to reduce those remaining radicals before they can damage another cell. So as long as you're grounded, that can't occur, occur. But as soon as you put your shoes on, then all of a sudden you start depleting yourself of free electrons. And then you run out of electrons, you don't have enough. To give you an example, uh, animals who live in the wild, dogs, deer, you know, all the animals, all the wild kingdom, Cancer very rarely manifests in the animal world. The only time it, ha it shows up is when humans have contaminated the animal environment. On the other hand, animals who live in doors with their owners, 50% of them die from an autoimmune disease. It's called cancer. The same one that 50% of all humans die from. Cancer is an autoimmune related health disorder. And I didn't want know that. That's a huge piece of information. Um, yes. Yeah. So, so, so this is an environment. So that says that what's causing all these inflammation-related health is is an environmental. It doesn't happen in nature. Doesn't happen in the natural animal world. It only happens to humans and animals who live indoors with their owners. So, as a conversation piece. Before you go on, as I read through your book, you mentioned inflammation. And uh -huh. as an Indian woman who has lived with the knowledge of nutrition, I have implicitly applied the knowledge that if you apply like adding more turmeric uh -huh. or doing activities that allow your body to decrease inflammation, that you're, you're enhancing your well-being. But how is that that we, we lost this knowledge as a soul? Well, it's because, you know, we've been overwhelmed with all the modern technology and video and, and <clears throat> it's like right now, everybody's an expert. <laughs> You know, and everybody's got an opinion and everybody's trying to sell something because everybody's trying to make money. And I understand all of it. And, uh, um, <clears throat> but how we, you know, it's like the, the natural things. Um, well, first of all, I want to say this. Health is your most natural state. If you go outdoors and, were to, and, and lived outdoors and stayed grounded the rest of your life, your inflammation would resolve, disappear, your body would return to normal, and you would, you would have health. Um, if you're, so, um, but anyhow, if you do not have health, then something is interfering with your immune system, because the only thing that uh, the immune system does is maintain and restore health. So if the immune system is compromised, which by cutting off our ground and the, the immune system losing its ground or its uh, resource to mop up the excess remaining radicals, that's the problem. So when we lost our ground, we lost that connection to the earth. We lost our source of free electrons to maintain the human body or the immune system electrically stable and functionally as it was intended in nature. Now the immune system is oxidizing. It's, it's creating the, the immune system is producing the inflammation because it doesn't have anything to shut down and unwind the oxidative burst. So the immune system just keeps firing and firing and firing, trying to put out a fire that it itself is creating. Uh, you mentioned these modalities, don't get me wrong, I want to pr press them on, not only because others need it, because right. 
I need it. The, 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 thing I, I, the thing I try to do most of all is, I, I remember I was working with uh, some people at, at um, you know, uh, you know, like the state of California, the health services and so on, NIH and so on. <clears throat> and in visiting with some of the people, a lot of people understand what I'm doing and, and why and everything, and they understand. But you just can't. And they, they and they always told me that you have to, you have to go to the public if you're going to go out there and make noise and tell everybody you got a problem. You need to give them a no cost solution and or a low cost solution. And that's what I love about earthing because the first no cost solution is very simple. You get a chair, go outdoors, put your bare feet, take your shoes off, put your bare feet on the earth and sit there for just 30 minutes. It will be life changing. And it's free, 100% free. And it's best to do it in a little bit of shade with some sunlight near because you also lost your vitamin D because we have now live in homes with roofs. So in nature, <laughs> We lived outdoors, you know. Uh, so we lost our vitamin D. We lost our ground. We lost our vitamin G. Um, <clears throat> so, so anyhow, um, and then the second solution is if this works for you in 30 minutes and, and your blood viscosity, you pink up and your energy comes up, your pain comes down, your demeanor changes, and all of a sudden, wow, what's going on? Then maybe you need to be grounded during sleep. That's when you know, these products and all those kind of things are there for the people who can and, and need to. Uh, but, but, but the number of what I'm trying to get to is the no cost, low cost solution uh, to get, expect people to go out and buy something. Nobody, I mean, people can barely afford to buy groceries right now. Uh, so we have to give them solutions that work, that they can get results and it's free or it's close to free. Um, and so I've always had that mantra in, and so I don't do anything. I start the first thing I do, I, what I often do when I'm talking to, 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 to groups is I, and 90%, 99% of our customers are female. They're a mom between the ages of 35 and 55. The older women have more disposable income. The younger women are raising the kids and so on. And they all have some kind of a, some level of an autoimmune disease, anything from uh, fibromyalgia to lupus to cancer to it just goes on and on and on <clears throat> so the thing I try to help people to understand is first of all you need to learn what's really wrong what's going wrong your immune system is compromised because if your immune system were working perfectly you would have perfect health so something is compromising your immune system so we know after spending all 25 years of doing this research that just grounding alone electrically stabilizes the immune system. So if you can, you can shut down inflammation by doing one thing, putting your feet on the earth, the earth from who you are a part of, a piece and a part of, and you have lost contact and now your body is on fire. And <clears throat> so anyhow, but the number one thing, so I tell this story sometimes because it's a second part of this. It isn't what you're eating. It's it's what is eating you, uh, in, in most cases. Need for someone like you say, hey, yeah, you're on the right path. You you're like you're taking your socks off and. Well, the the thing you are on the right path. Uh, you 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 know that it benefits you. Otherwise, you wouldn't keep doing it. And so, uh, the the main thing that you have to realize that in nature we were grounded 24 7 just like the animals and inflammation can't exist in the body so what you have to do is you have to spend more time i, I tell especially women you have to go outdoors and you have to get grounded and stay grounded until your pain goes away if that means you have to sleep there for a week that's what you really ought to be doing because you'll get your health back. The body is a self-healing machine. It's, it, it's, it's, it, all you have to do is remove the stressors that are interfering with the immune system's ability to maintain health. The body is perfect. It knows what to do. It knows how to do it. We just are the So any of these issues, it's things that we're doing. And now to, to go beyond this, um, um, I, I mean, I could talk and tell stories forever but it's really a simple simple thing 
uh, you you have to start at the ground up. Let me let me share with you. I want to tell you a little story. Please do. And and when I, when I was a boy, I would be in a pasture, sitting on a horse, uh, riding around the pasture, and and some summers we would have an infestation of jackrabbits. That means there would be so many jackrabbits and where you look, there's jackrabbits everywhere. At night, you'd shine a light and look like you're shining out on the water because the, the light reflecting from their eyes. And it was like, where do all these rabbits come from? But anyhow, during the day, the rabbits are just sitting there eating grass all day long. That's all they do is eat grass. And then all of a sudden, a coyote gets, you know, shows up and he comes up and he's trying to sneak up on a jackrabbit. And the jackrabbit is sitting there eating grass and all of a sudden he senses the coyote and he will spring almost 10 feet into the air. And uh, these are those big long-legged jackrabbits. And uh, <clears throat> so anyhow, the coyote will jump and starts chasing the rabbit. The, the rabbit will zigzag back and forth across the pasture because he wants to keep one eye on the coyote. The coyote will just run like a dog just going after the coyote. The problem is, the, after a while, the coyote runs out of energy. So he will just drop to the ground most of the time. He doesn't, they, they catch rabbits, but not that often. But anyhow, he'll just drop to the ground. And then the rabbit will run just a little bit further, but still close enough that he can see the coyote. So what happened, what just took place was the rabbit was sitting there peacefully eating grass like nothing ever happened. And then all of a sudden, he was his life was threatened so the cortisol goes screaming i mean it releases you get a big shot of cortisol and so now the rabbit's got all this energy and it can you know run and jump and bounce and do whatever and now that it's the chase is over the coyote's resting and he's going to get up and wander off but the rabbit's going to sit there and say i mean he's sitting there and he's you can actually see them quivering because he just had his life threatened, shaking, full of anxiety, full of, you know, and so on. And, and then all of a sudden, the rabbit will have a big visceral shake like this. And then it'll go back to eating grass like nothing ever happened. So it grounded out the stress. It grounded out the inflammation that was created from the cortisol and so on. So I, the reason I tell this story is I, I need women to relate to it. Because what does a woman do every day? First, I mean, not every woman, but just generally. The woman gets up in the morning and she's got to take care of the kids. Get them fed, get them off to school, get them, what, you know, just it's chaos. And, and every time there's some pushback or whatever, then there's a little cortisol spike. And then if you, you, know, you have a husband, same thing, he's got to get off to work and do whatever and get him out the door, whatever. Again, more, you know, pushing and stress and and then when they're gone then the woman has to stop and take care of herself for a little bit and then get ready to go to work or whatever and then uh so and then she she's on insulated from the earth not grounded whatsoever at any period of time here and so anyhow so but her body has cortisol starting to run in the veins and then she gets gets ready to go and goes and sits in the car, creates static electricity, and then driving down the road. And then, um, right, you know, what they call road rage or anxiety. You know, you start driving and, and, and there's just all this tension going on. And then you get out of the car, go to work, and you go indoors. You get, you're underneath fluorescent lights all day, and you're, you're, um, <clears throat> um, you got employees you, or uh, customers or, heaven only knows what and then at the end of the day you're totally drained totally exhausted then you got to go back home drive back home and then you got to fix dinner and so on and so on so women's cortisol is constantly being chronically squirt by squirt by squirt i call it coyote juice something women need to re realize anytime somebody threatens you or does anything to elevate your cortisol call them their coyotes because your body is full of cortisol so coyote juice this is think of this as a coyote think of when somebody snaps at you or somebody pushes you or somebody threatens you or just puts demands on you that cause your body to release cortisol so there so the world is full of 
uh, of coyotes and they're always coming at you. So, <clears throat> so what you have to do is recognize, first of all, that you're, when your body is flooded with cortisol or when your cortisol is chronically elevated like it is for most women, then <clears throat> what happens, the first thing that shows up is anxiety because you have this tension in your body. You know, and, and then uh, <clears throat> you know, anxiety, irritability, and then depression. And then if this goes on for long periods of time, which it does by the time you start getting into your 30s and 40s, then what happens is this cortisol creates inflammation in the body. And the stress that people are creating on you, the coyote juice, is what's, causing, what's feeding and causing the inflammation in your body. It's not that you didn't eat enough blueberries. It isn't that you didn't do this or you didn't do that. The number one cause of chronically elevated cortisol is fight or flight. It's a natural innate fight or flight that we all have. And if we respond, the more we respond, um, then the more cortisol and then the cortisol does damage. First of all, it shows up as anxiety, irritability, depression, fibromyalgia, lupus, MS. Then it goes on to breast cancer and goes on to this, goes on to that and whatever. These are all like, like um, the boys uh, <clears throat> uh, at, you know, when they, they did the inflammation. <clears throat> uh, they said it's very simple. You, you, what you have is chronically elevated inflammation. It, and it manifests in all these different health disorders. You can't have these, you have to have inflammation first. So what's causing the inflammation? So I just want you to know that this is because of the, your surroundings, the people and the pressure, the stress you're putting on yourself um, because of you know difference like in your marriage or your family and all these things, That's that puts pressure on you that puts stress on you and that causes cortisol to become elevated in your body it's well you're you're not victims of well we, we are victims of our culture uh, of the television of the messaging and everything that's going on we are a piece and a part of our culture and of our civilization and, and, you know, civilization rubs against nature. And when that happens, then that's what's causing this friction, what's causing chronically elevated cortisol, which causes all these things. So, the, so what people have to do, and it's easy for me now, I'm pushing 80. So, you know, I, I've come to terms with it all. <laughs> I spent half my life trying to figure it out. And then uh, one day you get it. And then after that, you, you look at the world differently. You, you give up your possessions or not that everybody should go give up anything. I'm, I'm just saying that you give up those things in life that are causing stress or pain. Uh, <clears throat> people, you, you, have to, you have to find yourself and quit living for everybody else. Take care of yourself first. If you don't do that, it does not matter because you're going to get sick and die a miserable, a slow, miserable death. So you, you really do need to stop and take charge of yourself. You need to figure out what that is. Everybody does individually. Uh, <clears throat> but the thing that I that calms my soul, calms my being, is to be as close to nature as I possibly can. Because nature calms my body, nature calms my soul. Nature, uh, <clears throat> there's beauty all around. There's, there's. Nature is, um, it, it is, who I want to be. Uh, it's who I am. I am a piece and a part of the earth. I am from the earth. I come from the earth. I live off the earth. I breathe the earth. I'm going to go back to the earth, and that's who I am. And that's what I am. And I recognize that. I accept that. And so in the meantime, I've tried to make my life about helping other people come to terms with uh, any way I can help them to, to recognize the benefits of reconnecting with nature. Electrically is definitely one way, but also, also you know, it's like a, a grass, is, a blade of grass is your cousin, you know? <laughs> we're all connected, we're all related, we're all one thing. And, I don't know why half the world is, but it's like the old saying, you know, 
you, you, you wouldn't know what good is if there wasn't any bad. And, and so there's this double-edged sword, this, there are two sides to everything, and you just have to find yourself in between all of that and find peace. You have to create your own peace. You meditate. That's a way of finding peace, quieting the system, quieting everything. But you need to be grounded when you're doing it so you can drain the inflammation out and, and, and get that tension out of your body um, and, and get, you know, get back in tune. When you, uh, when you touch the earth or you're connected to the earth electrically, then you are electrically one and the same as the earth. The earth is infinitely large and it's stable. When you get grounded, you become stable. All that noise in your brain stops. All of that craziness comes, you know, calms down. Um, I do grounding and uh -huh. mostly inspired by you. And I was in my backyard. I take my socks off. We we have a small backyard, very small. Uh -huh. It's a little bit of grass. And I'm walking around. And my son, who's 10 years old, he's amused by everything. So yes the pine nuts that are falling off of the the palm trees mm -hmm. whatever you call them they're uh -huh. they're all over our backyard our small backyard full of grass he picks them up and throws them into a little puddle and what i got out of that was being present yes yes that's most important nothing can be more important than being present because the future doesn't matter because you don't know the past is gone it's gone you know i want yeah i wanted to share one thing with you about your mom you know <clears throat> i started grounding people 20 some years ago and one day i was grounding a lady who had ms and i asked her i said you know what happened in your life to cause ms to manifest and she said i don't know i i just all of a sudden she was like in her 30s she said all of a sudden one day it, it just showed up and then it kept getting worse and worse and now she has no control of her arms and whatever <clears throat> and i didn't say too much after that and then i kept setting her up and getting her grounded and then she said oh my goodness i never thought about it but my mom had uh, died a couple of years earlier and um, she said something just changed in me and <clears throat> and i spent a lot of time you know, in grief and uh, uh, sadness and and so on. And and then she said, even now, I'm still emotionally charged with this. And so <clears throat> what has happened is, um, and, and the reason I tell that story is because now, even to this day, 20 years later, I still ask everybody, what happened in your life that caused this to manifest, whether it's lupus or MS or cancer, breast cancer, whatever it is, what happened in your life to cause this to manifest? Every single woman has a story of loss and they've gotten, um, they don't know how to let go or they don't know how to grieve properly. They don't know how to accept loss and so on. And sometimes you need professional help. You definitely need friends, you know, to help, but, but there's, so many people who have these serious autoimmune related health disorders are because they're living in this chronically elevated sympathetic state, which is causing the cortisol to remain elevated. And they're, and they're just uh, full of grief and full of loss and feel of loss. And it can be loss of a mate, loss of a house, loss of anything, loss of a dream, all of these things. And people just go into the state. You, you have to take every day and start over, no matter what. And, and I also believe that what value you are giving to the world with with earthing, okay? I'm going to emphasize this everywhere and everywhere I can, is that we have tools. Mm -hmm. And your soul has given a, was given a mission, Flint. I think so. <laughs> Earthing took me to the next level. Grounding, yeah. I, I, let, let's get let's get it real. I I kind of knew about grounding, but it wasn't until somebody who was scientific like you, Clint, mm -hmm. who had the background, and explained it. I was like, oh. but it is still 
extremely scientific. It's not something esoteric. No, it's yeah, it's pure physics. I I, I was given a, the opportunity to help share this when I retired when I was fifty. I you know I was looking for something I could do to help out rather than to just be a good consumer. And this showed up and I every day of my life since I've been trying to share this with primarily moms, primarily young moms who are challenged because of their mom and their children and their family and the stress of just living today. Mom. And everybody can find peace. You just have to carve it out and get present. Um. I, I just don't have enough words to express my gratitude towards what you have done. Now, Lou, one last thing, because only because I'm such a scientific individual, I know we've gone over, but in your book, you talk about the soles of the feet and how grounding and when your feet touch the soil. Can, can you touch a little bit about that? Well, <clears throat> the palms of the hand the bottom of the feet, and specifically K1, acupuncture point, which is on all four. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so that is the, uh, you know, the, the ancient Taoist yogis used to say that was where earth energy enters the body. And as far as the science goes, those points are the most conductive points on the human body. So if you're standing barefoot on the earth, then you're, there's better conductivity, but it's also the way the body works. I mean, you know, in nature, you would be standing on the earth or you'd be touching live things or whatever with your hands. So it makes sense for them to be the most conductive and the most sensitive to ground. Um, because on the surface of the skin, you may have five megs of resistance mega ohms of resistance, where here you have only a few K. So, yeah, so these are the things that, you know, another thing too that I wanted to share with you um, is women have uh, twice as many pain sensors as men do, meaning they're more sensitive to everything in their environment and that contributes to this elevated cortisol also, because the more sensitive you are, the more, because the, the parasympathetic uh, or the sympathetic nervous system senses everything in the environment, electrical or everything, uh, you know, feelings and whatever. And, and if it feels a threat, then cortisol comes up. The parasympathetic normally calms that down by mod or, you know, releasing another hormone to give you a few seconds to determine whether you want to run or fight or whatever. But <clears throat> the problem is, is eventually you, when you are chronically elevated sympathetic, chronically elevated sympathetic, then the adrenals have a limited supply of hormones and they become exhausted. As soon as they become exhausted, then the parasympathetic can overdrive and then you become even more sensitive and that creates more pain and more you know irritability and anxiety and so on so but when you touch the earth it puts the inflammation out and it calms the sympathetic nervous system the parasympathetic nervous system comes back and then you can breathe and you're blood oxygenation changes, you, you get easier to uptake O2, your O2 saturation and your blood thins because it, now it's more negative and the little red blood cells repel each other. Now they can get in and out of the capillaries and clean and clean up the uh, extremities and, and, the, and uh, the spirit keeps all the things that are in the, when you have poor circulation, everything, it creates inflammation. So anyhow, it's, but I don't know where to go or how much further to go, but it's basically uh, 
the first thing that anybody should do is go back in nature. One, get grounded, drain the inflammation out of your body. But you need to reconnect with the spirit of who you are. You are part of the earth. You are the earth. We are together, the earth. We make up the earth. And so, Clint, like my my modalities, given who I am as a human, is uh -huh. um, my morning starts out typically, not always, but typically, especially after I discovered you and earthing, which again <laughs> is throwing us a spin on. Uh -huh. I I I take my lemon tea in the morning, mm -hmm. go in my backyard, which is a small one, and I walk barefoot. And I do my mantras, and you probably are aware of mantras, but yes. I repeat my mantras, positive mm -hmm. mantras. And right. sometimes it's three minutes, sometimes it's 15, 20 minutes. Right. And I come home, well, walk into my home, and I meditate. These are the kind of things I think that people need to know that we all need to practice. It's not like, a, a fad. It's it's something they'll truly yeah. become grounded to who you really are as humans. Yeah, yeah. It's really about quieting the mind and finding yourself, finding who you are, not who everybody wants you to be, not who everybody thinks you are, not anybody. Just yourself. You need to come to terms with it. You need to get yourself happy and healthy. You have to sometimes give up beliefs. Give up all beliefs. There's, you know, you don't want any beliefs. You want to know, and, and that something's right, and and just do the right things and do what's in your heart, and and just, um, you know, it's it's easier said than done. I didn't, it took me years to figure it out, <laughs> but the older you get, it happens automatically. You give do, up. Clint, do you, do, you, do you meditate? <laughs> oh yeah. Yes. And yeah. um, what what is your thought about um, just taking your shoes off and allowing yourself to just walking in the backyard? Oh, You're it's vital. It's vital. You you know, any amount of grounding is good. More is better. So you have to ground for at least fifteen to thirty minutes just to get the inflammation down, and then calm so you can calm down a little bit. Uh, but that's not enough. I mean, in nature, your body's designed to be grounded 24 seven, like the animals, like all other living creatures on this planet. Nature did not know that we were going to invent plastics and plasticize the world. Did not know that we were going to cut the ground off. And what I told you, I, I mentioned earlier that growing up in a very orthodox Indian family, the moment we entered the home, we were asked mm -hmm. to take the shoes off. Yes. Yes, you never wore shoes in the home, no. And my husband, who's American, he still wears his shoes. But the moment I wear the, uh, enter the home, I take my shoes off. Right. Yep. So you don't need to be concerned about what your husband does. You need to be concerned about what you do. Yeah. But, you know, he was raised in American culture. But yeah. I still feel like that grounding is real well it is real and it's self-evident all you have to do is go stand on the earth yes. and it'll talk to you you will... oh my goodness clint you have provided intense value today i mean not only just working through your book which i'm going to hopefully invite you back if you are willing to sure and you bet go through the details of the book but um what you've done for me is immense because since i started truly earthing or what mm -hmm. i call grounding in my backyard it's changed my sleeping pattern yes yep and drained out it drained out the coyote juice got to get the coyote juice out before otherwise you can't sleep and, and trust me, I, I still struggle with sleep, but it's not because no. of lack of grounding. It's because of the days I skip grounding, right? I I struggle, but yeah. I have honored 
so deeply honored that you were here today. Well, thank you so much. I am honored the fact that you invited me and allowed me to share with your people. For those who do not know, you provide earthing products. Can you maybe share one last bit about that before we sign on? Yeah, what we did when we were doing all of our studies, you know, we would ground a group of 10, 20, 30, 60 people. And at the end of the studies, everybody wanted to keep their the little mats that we made up or the patches or whatever product we grounded them with. They wanted to be able to keep them and take them home. And then they would come back and want them for their mom or their brother or somebody. And then so over about 10 years, we ended up having to uh, start making little products because one, the more people learned about grounding and experienced the benefit, the more they wanted it and the more they wanted to share it. So we ended up making a half a dozen simple, very simple products. One of them is a, you know, probably a 13 inch by 20, 30 inch uh, mat that is conductive, meaning uh, so you connect it to a wire is connected to the electrical ground or to a ground. And so when you lay on it, Earth's energy comes up the wire, comes and uh, <clears throat> uh, grounds the pad. So when you lay on it, then you're grounded, just like laying outdoors on the grass. And <clears throat> so we created a simple one that everybody can afford. I don't know what they sell for, but they're well less than $100, the whole kit. And then uh, we had mats. Uh, that are the size of a bed, you know, the mattress covers. So you just put them on your bed and then plug them in and lay down and go to sleep and get well. Uh, sleep is the most important time to ground yourself because that's when the body heals and restores itself. So that's when the body recovers. During the day, you're fighting the bear and sustaining life. But at night, the body heals and recovers and restores. So it's really important to ground yourself before bedtime or if you can sleep grounded. But the concept here was we had to give these products because uh, they are so profound what they do. And you'll never know unless you go outdoors, first of all, ground yourself and then experience these products because it's not believable that inflammation is caused because of you wear shoes. Heaven only knows shoes are essential. You know, well, <laughs> only in the last few years, <laughs> you know, um, they were a functional thing to protect the feet, you know, in the early days. But for the most part, people have always been barefoot. Even when I was a kid, I'm you know, pushing 80 now. But when I was a kid, I, we were barefoot all the time. We wouldn't wear shoes unless we had to. And that was to go to church or whatever. And they were leather. And then even then we had to uh, take them off if it rained and carry them because if they got wet, they'd curl up and get gnarly when they dried. <laughs> so uh, well, my dad, who was raised in a village in India, uh -huh. all they talk about is is running barefoot everywhere. Right. Yeah, the, it, barefoot is very common. It's very, very common throughout the world. I would imagine there's more barefoot people than there are shod people in, in the world. Ever since I started doing more implicit grounding last few months, when my son says, let's go out and play. I will, I will like, okay, I'm going to go out and play and I won't even wear my shoes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Lose the shoes. Wear shoes on purpose. The blacktop is hot. <laughs> There's glass. <laughs> wear shoes on purpose. Yes. You know, a baby was never born with a pair of shoes on. No. Oh my goodness. I, I sincerely hope you say yes when I uh, invite you back because. Sure. So many aspects of what you shared that are so deeply rooted with my core values. Well, I'm glad to hear that, and I'm more than happy to uh, come back anytime and uh, just give me a little notice, get on the schedule, and that's what I do is do the best I can to share as much as I can. Thank you, Clint. So okay, much well, you bet. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. Thanks again for tuning in. Check out the links in the description and please subscribe, follow, and share. And continue to practice Omni Mindfulness.